Just quickly on a couple of other fronts, though, Attorney-General Christian Porter has been praised by Peter Dutton today for standing up to then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull during a tense exchange that could have led to a constitutional drama. Paul Kelly reported in The Australian Today that the day before Mr Turnbull was deposed, he clashed with his Attorney-General over whether to involve the Governor-General in that leadership crisis. Specifically, the then PM had suggested that Sir Peter Cosgrove would not commission Peter Dutton as Prime Minister because of doubts over his constitutional eligibility. He apparently suggested that he'd actually advise the Governor-General not to commission Peter Dutton on those grounds. Well, Christian Porter insisted that view was wrong in law, as the Governor-General only had to consider whether a Prime Minister could command the support of the House of Representatives, whether he had the numbers, questions over constitutional eligibility of someone to be an MP, according to Christian Porter, were not the Governor-General's concern. So this led to a standoff between the two and threats from the Attorney-General to resign and publicly repudiate the Prime Minister. Now, in the end, Malcolm Turnbull did raise public doubts about Dutton's eligibility, but we don't know if he did actually discuss these issues at any point with the Governor-General. It all became a little academic, given Scott Morrison, rather than Peter Dutton, of course, won the leadership. But there is still the lingering question over Peter Dutton's eligibility to sit in Parliament, given his wife's ownership of a childcare centre and the government subsidies involved in that business. The Solicitor General, you may recall, during that week of leadership drama, did eventually advise there was some doubt, but the better view was that Peter Dutton was fine. He had every right to sit in Parliament. Now, in the last couple of hours, the former PM, Malcolm Turbull, has broken his silence on this and doubled down, really. He's taken to Twitter with this explanation. He says, The discretion to swear in a person as PM is vested in the Governor-General. The proposition advanced by Mr Porter that it's none of the GG's business whether he would be PM, the would-be PM, is constitutionally eligible is nonsense. The GG, Governor-General, is not a constitutional cipher. Malcolm Turbull goes on to say... During the week of 24 August 2018, there was advice from leading constitutional lawyers, Brett Walker, that Dutton was ineligible to sit in the parliament and thus ineligible to be a minister, let alone prime minister. I ensured we sought the advice of the Solicitor General. The Solicitor General's advice was delivered on the morning of Friday the 24th and duly published. And his advice was that the better view was that Dutton was eligible, but it was impossible to state that position with certainty. And there was some risk. The High Court would rule he was ineligible. And finally, Malcolm Turnbull goes on to say, I took the responsible course of action, obtained the necessary advice, published it, and the party room was informed when it made its decision to elect Mr Morrison rather than Mr Dutton as leader. So the discretion to swear in a person as PM is vested in the Governor-General. The proposition advanced, uh, as, as you saw there, according to Malcolm Turnbull from Christian Porter, is wrong. He's essentially arguing, yes, Paul Kelly's story is right. They did differ on this. But he's standing by his view that it was absolutely fair for the Governor-General to weigh up whether Peter Dutton was eligible to sit in Parliament before considering whether to swear him in as Prime Minister. He's also given a little reminder there that there is still a little question over Peter Dutton's eligibility. And his wife has not sold the childcare centre. And this has given Labor a chance today to revive this whole issue and suggest Peter Dutton refer himself to the High Court. Not likely to happen. But anyway, here was Peter Dutton backing in Christian Porter for the position he took. Christian Porter is a person of uh, great integrity and decency and he really impressed me during that week because he didn't take sides. He uh, looked at what needed to be done as the Attorney-General of our country and he saw uh, inappropriate uh, behaviour taking place. He called it out and he stood up to it. And you're right, it was a gutsy move and I think he deserves full credit for it. The job of the Attorney-General is to provide advice that he or she considers is accurate. Uh, and legally correct, and sometimes that advice is not always what people want to hear. Well, let's uh, talk more about this. I'm joined by the Shadow Foreign Minister and Labor Senate Leader Penny Wong from Adelaide this afternoon. Thanks very much for joining us, Senator. Just uh, on this issue, will Labor be seeking to refer Peter Dutton to the High Court? They were pretty extraordinary allegations, weren't they, uh, uh, on this channel and, and in the newspaper this morning? Uh, very serious allegations, which not only go to the extraordinary division uh, inside the coalition, but go to, as you have pointed out, real questions about Mr Dutton's eligibility. 
Uh, he should refer himself. Uh, I, I think it's pretty clear there is a question about his eligibility. Uh, and the government really does need to resolve this issue. It doesn't appear that it's been resolved. Uh, in fact, I hadn't seen Mr Turnbull's text that, uh, tweet that you just uh, uh, referenced, but it, it's quite clear that uh, this is still a live issue and, and Peter Dutton really does need to resolve it. Well, I don't think the government or Peter Dutton is, is about to refer himself. Will Labor seek to do so in the Parliament? Oh, look, that's an issue... Uh, you know, we, we would look at. Uh, I think, uh, uh, obviously, we doesn't need the Parliament to do the right thing here. Mr Dutton should do the right thing. I mean, he, he can assure himself and assure the Australian people and the Parliament of his eligibility or, or he can refer himself. Let's move on to uh, some other matters. North Korea, of course, the concern today over this Australian man who's reportedly been detained in North Korea. Um, from what you've heard from the government, are they handling this appropriately so far? Uh, we did contact the Foreign Minister's office as soon as we became aware of these public reports and I understand they were making urgent inquiries. Uh, since I uh, had a press conference earlier today, I, I see that a uh, spokesperson for the family of, of a person named in, in some of the reports has put out a statement. I think there are still inquiries underway. Uh, and, you know, we offer our full support for uh, the government in whatever action it's taking, whatever inquiries it's making, whatever consular assistance it's providing. Uh, our first objective should be to ensure any Australian is safe and secure. I appreciate in most of these cases you do back in uh, the government. Can I ask, though, would you expect the Prime Minister to raise this with President Trump, given his connection with Kim Jong-un in North Korea? Well, I think that's a judgment the government needs to make, uh, having ascertained what the facts on the ground actually are. And I see that there are public reports which uh, uh, there are, in relation to which there are some differences as to the actual state of affairs. Uh, my view about these sorts of issues is, uh, rather than engage in, in, in public uh, sort of megaphone about what the government should or shouldn't do. Uh, we do try to ensure we work with the government uh, to ensure the safety and security of Australians. If, if those sorts of conversations privately are helpful to the, the safety and security of this, Australians, uh, this Australian, then they should be had. Uh, but that's a judgment the government will need to make. All right. Can I turn to Iran? So later today, Iran has warned it will breach the international nuclear agreement. It will increase its stockpile of enriched uranium to uh, 300 kilograms or more. Australia isn't party to this agreement, but it's been a supporter of it. Do you think we've reached the point where Australia should withdraw that support? Well, uh, we and, and the government, well, certainly Julie Bishop uh, uh, and others, were supportive of the JCPOA. And the reason is, uh, as I, th I think I said on this program and certainly on others, it might not be the perfect agreement, but we, we saw it as... Uh, the only available path to ensure that we did avert uh, the, uh, you know, the, the path that Iran was on. Uh, we saw it as an important uh, aspect of you know, multilateral or plurilateral arrangements. Uh, if, if the agreement is breached, then the agreement is breached, and that's a very serious consequence. Uh, we, our support has been for an agreement that we urged be, be retained on foot. That's a position not just that Julie Bishop agreed with, but obviously the European Union and other parties to the agreement. Uh, it is... You know, the, the, the Iranian regime has been a, a destabilising force in the region for some time, uh, and that is of great concern. And look, the Trump administration's walked away from this deal, and now if Iran itself is generating more enriched uranium than the deal allows, it's, it's pretty much over, isn't it, this, this agreement? Well, the, the, a, a new course the, will have to be found. Uh, and we would encourage a new course to be found, uh, and that's always harder, obviously. It's one of the reasons why we were prepared uh, in the last term to back the agreement. It's always... You know, the, 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 if you've got something that's actually on the table, that's easier than something not at all on the table. Uh, and it is in the world's interest to, to try and uh, ensure that this con continued nuclear agenda doesn't progress. What do you think of the suggestion that Australia should join some sort of international effort to provide uh, military escorts for oil tankers in the Persian Gulf uh, amid concerns? This is, this is where this is going to go, this conflict. I'll make a few comments. I think that the first is, there's no doubt, you know, the Iranian regime has been destabilising uh, force in the region. There's been, uh, you know, obviously, sponsorship of 
terrorism, uh, uh, obviously the nuclear um, uh, agenda, a whole range of destabilising destabilizing, behaviours. Uh, but as Mr Albanese said, I think, a couple of days ago, we, we do want cool heads to prevail. Uh, and we, we know the price of military conflict in this region. We know the price of escalation. And we would urge there not to be uh, a, a further escalation uh, in the region. Uh, leaving those issues aside, in relation to um, uh, the transit of uh, civilian ships, uh, that's obviously an issue uh, we're all concerned about. Uh, and that, that would have to be considered. I, I see this is actually a proposition I think former Senator Molan put, but uh, mm. if, the, if the government wishes to consider that, we would obviously uh, seek a briefing on that. We, are see, we have sought a briefing in relation to the broader issue of, of Iran, uh, which mm. we look, uh, look to be providing. But, but, but on this, oh, it, it sounds like you're not close to the idea. You, you don't see it as an, an escalation if we were to be involved in military escorts? Uh, I think I think we, we we need to be very clear as to the difference between ensuring that you know, civilian ships, for example, mm. are, are are safe, which is something I've expressed concern about. But the broader issue of military conflict, there's been a lot of uh, rhetoric, shall we say, a lot of discussion, and and I think that the United the UK Foreign Secretary, uh, you know, was very sensible when he when he pointed out when asked questions about military conflict in the region, he, he said he couldn't envisage a situation where the UK would be asked nor agreed to engage in uh, an escalation of military conflict. On the G20 summit, it's about to get underway in Japan. Do you think the Morrison government's done enough to state Australia's position strongly that we want this trade dispute between China and the US resolved? Uh, I, it is important that Mr Morrison use not only the G20 meeting but also the well publicised dinner with uh, the President of the United States to advocate Australia's interests. There's a broader proposition, which is, as a trading nation, we have an interest in fair, transparent and open trading arrangements, and there, are, there is a case for reform of the multilateral trading arrangements. But it is also important that we make very clear, as a staunch ally and friend of the United States, that we don't want Australia's interests to be ignored uh, nor damaged in the context of this trade dispute, and we should make the same uh, argument uh, in advocacy to China. When you say there's a case for reform of the World Trade Organisation, does that mean uh, listing China as a developed rather than a developing country? Oh, that is one aspect. I think that the Mr Morrison has spoken about that, and as have others, uh, the US administration as well. I think there is also a question of intellectual property. There, is an question, there are questions of subsidies. There are a range of questions about existing multilateral arrangements, and they should be up for discussion uh, at, to ensure that those rules are fit for purpose and reflect the fact uh, not only that China has developed further, but that China has substantial weight in the global economy, and, and we, we, we ought to respect that and reflect that. Uh, but uh, in terms of Australia's position, we have an interest in fair multilateral arrangements. What we don't want, uh, and I've said many times, is a trade war where not just Australia but many other economies lose. Uh, no one does win from a trade war. That's the that's the lesson of history, and we we have an added uh, interest in uh, in averting that because of uh, the, being a middle si middle sized economy, a substantial economy that is uh, very open in terms of its trade to the world. Just a final one before I let you go. Uh, John Setka yesterday convicted of harassing a woman. Um, you did a uh, uh, long time ago work for the CFMEU. Do you now think? He should go, not only from the Labor Party, but from his union leadership position? Well, uh, I, I certainly have put my view about his membership of the Labor Party, and as someone in the leadership of the Labor Party, that's a view that I can express and that Mr Albanese, Anthony Albanese, has expressed uh, uh, as to Mr Secker's membership. His position in the union is ultimately a matter for his members, but I do note that uh, the ACTU and uh, Sally McManus have... Uh, have, uh, have asked him to step aside. Uh, and I think the point mm. that has been made is that there is no individual which is bigger than the collective. Uh, and uh, there's no individual that's bigger than the movement. But, you know, I've, I've had a fair bit to say about... Uh, previously about Mr mm. Secker. I don't really have anything to add. You're not one of those members anymore of, the, of that union? I'm not a member of his division. Oh, all right, your South Australian division. Oh, and I was in the uh, what was it? I was actually in what you call the furnishing division. That's uh, that's actually where I started my career. So people who made uh, furniture. So uh, 
Uh, but I'm not All right. a member right. of the but, South but are, are you, 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 Okay, but you're a member of the South Australian CFMM EU division. Yeah, is that yeah. Right? yes, I still, I still have, I still have t membership historically. I think of membership of the ASU as well. Right, right. OK, but it's not your decision, essentially, as a member of that union from the South Australian Division to make a call on John Setka. But it's... Uh, correct, and, and it's also a different division, but I have a role as a member of the Labor Party and in the leadership of the Labor Party. You might recall I pointed out quite some time ago that I thought Mr Setka could, should consider his position. You might also, uh, you know, recall that uh, you know, I think uh, we, uh, I and others talked about values. Mm. Penny Wong, indeed you did, uh, Shadow Foreign Minister and Labor Senate leader. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate that.